Podcasts. And we are number one in web programming, Ancha. Can you believe that? That's How amazing. did that happen? Did you write that chapter on web programming? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no chapter about web programming, but... Uh, this is the book. The ebook version is out right now. Looks like the price actually went down, so that's good for folks. Uh, the paperback is coming, is coming in. Um, they say here. Wait, I think it says like December nineteenth. Uh, but you'll you'll start getting it probably in the next couple weeks. I think I it's in full copy. color. Yeah. No, this is the old <laughs> one, dude. Oh. 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 No, get... you you gave me this book. When we're AI engineering, no, th that was the old book. Oh, that was the old book. Never yeah. mind. Oh man, oh, yeah. never mind. There is no print version of this yet. This is in the printer as we speak, being uh, printed. The ink Full is drawing. <laughs> print it for yourself. Yeah, get a PDF and print it yourself. There you go. <laughs> totally go to Kinkos or yeah, oh. yeah whatever FedEx. <laughs> it's three hundred pages. No matter what this thing says, it's over three hundred pages and. Uh, Ancha, how much time do we spend on this over the summer? Oh, gosh, another bunch of hours <laughs> and weeks. Yeah, this was our side project. <laughs> and months. So. But it's fun. <laughs> it's fun coming it, seeing it coming all together and finally being able to share it with everyone. So, yeah, super excited about this. Yeah. So, um, and actually, the, the next six months, starting in January, starting, so we're not going to meet next month, um, but... In January, Ancha and I are going to take two, uh, basically two chapters every month, and we're going to talk about them. We're going to answer questions, and uh, you know, so we will go through the whole thing together and give you some of the, the horror stories of how we got here and all that kind of stuff. So, all right, and I think the kids want to want us to continue on here. Um, the attendees. And what do we have? So back to the webinar here, we've got Pat McFadden um, is able to join us. I'm glad we, we got him in. Hello, Pat. Make sure you introduce yourself when you start your talk. I will. Um, uh, cool. I'm going to do a quick, uh, so Pat's going to have about 30, 35 minutes. We always give the guests a little bit more time, as much time as they need. And then I'm going to do uh, Langchain and a bit on Llama Index for RAG and beyond. Um, it's a little bit of uh, like, level 100 but goes into level 200 so there there will be some uh technical depth in that talk and then also um i will make sure that i show a visual question answer with a uh hugging face multimodal model and i'll do that live in a notebook here and we're gonna upload some charts and some netflix stock uh charts and things and try to answer questions um and uh from those charts so uh, Ancha, I think you're going to drop off, but Ancha is principal developer advocate, also co-author of this book. And do you, anything else you want to say before you go, Ancha? Um, I'm excited to catch up on the recording of this today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I do have to drop. I, I have a lot of stuff coming up for reinvent. I have to make sure it's ready. But yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely going to listen into this. We share them on the YouTube channel. So if anyone um, has missed the previous meet up as well check out the youtube channel which i want to gonna do as well after this <laughs> okay and also reminder in the chat change it make sure that you change this to everyone above pat i think you're even chatting with just me and ancha there um uh, i think okay so change that little drop down to everyone and we'll be good to go take oh, it away pat look at me Oh, sorry. It's like the first time I've ever used Zoom before, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to 2018. <laughs> yeah, that should be in everyone. Hey, sorry. You know, yeah, what I said was like somebody was like, hey, can we get going? And I'm like, come on. We always put a little pad in the beginning because everyone shows up late. And yeah. sure enough, you know, I mean, there was like 35, 50 people that showed up five minutes after. So we know you. Time is valuable. Yeah. So, all right, let's get going here. Uh, I'm going to take the screen, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, hang on. And uh, we'll probably get a thousand questions about if your slides are available anywhere and all that. So if you can uh, maybe share a link at some point or. Yeah, um, I need I need to. I have so many different versions. I need to get them out there, though. Um, if you want, I can share a, a link with you and then you can just send it to everyone in the meetup group via the email. 
That way it's clear okay. that like this talk. Yeah, let's let's make it work for everybody. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, man. Take it away. Uh, taking it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Patrick McFadden. I um I'm Apache Cassandra committer. Um, I like to put in the Cal Poly engineering just because if you're a Cal Poly engineer, go Mustangs. But um I'm also uh I also have a book that you should probably check out because right now it got really more in interesting. Um I wrote a book with Jeff Carpenter, who's um also written some great books around databases and infrastructure um around managing cloud native data in kubernetes and uh, it's the whole stack uh the interesting part that more like relevant and now <laughs> is that there's a whole section on doing ai and generative ai workloads in kubernetes um and i pointed it out as emerging and it is but it is quickly changing kubecon was last week uh or the week before and uh you could just see that this is where a lot of things are headed and mainly because local running your local AI infrastructure, like quote unquote local, meaning you, you control the infrastructure, whether you're doing Kubernetes in the cloud or running it on your laptop, it's your control. So very interesting point of view. I'm going to use this as a springboard to talk about this. Now this is my safe Harbor statement. Hey everyone, this is us, right? We're all feeling a little stressed out behind the curve and we all have a boss saying, hey, we need an AI, right? Um, and if you're not that person, how long have you been working at Google? <laughs> Kidding. Um, the, and I just want to make sure we all know this because we should give each other a bit of a break. We're all learning as quickly as possible because it is changing quickly. I mean, look what happened with OpenAI this weekend. From one week, they went from like, we're going to dominate all generative AI forever. And then they had a complete mix up and mash, mash up in their, I mean, the management is changing people are, it is crazy town so let's just all work together and this is how we can do things as a community um i work on apache cassandra project so of course i think communities are awesome because that's how we build really cool things but let's just keep that in mind as we're doing this together um ask questions answer questions participate in the community and the thing that i want to point out this is kind of my beginning statement. I, I've been doing a lot of meetups, been working at a lot of conferences, talking to a lot of developers, working with a lot of VCs. Um, these are the three things that I see right now as success for what you're doing with generative AI, whether or not it's a matter of you're doing a simple POC, like a chat bot, or you're really going for it and you're trying to build like the agent to take over the planet, whatever your mode is. Um, the three things for success are keep it simple, um, keep it private and secure and always seek that performance for the lowest price. And a third point is really important because um, generative AI in, is the most expensive workload you're going to run right now. It just doesn't, there's not a cheap option um, and there's not a overwhelming option. It doesn't like you have to go out and buy an A100 card or something um, for $10,000 to even start. But it's a very compute intensive uh, workload that will generate a lot of cost if you're not careful. So we're always trying to keep, like, how do we keep our performance up for a low price? Now, um, the question that I uh, I always get is like, where are we going? And I think this is a good question right now. Here we are kind of at the end of 2023. It's been a year, about a year since ChatGPT came out. And uh we we've all probably built a, a chat bot or tried to build a chat bot and that was great um but where are we going as a, as a as an industry um and especially with generative ai and it really comes down to agents um agents are in some form and um this slide just got way more interesting because now open ai has their own agent infrastructure as well um and it's very simple agent infrastructure but uh, Andre Kapathy was the one who was very uh, forward about this. This was a, a meetup earlier, uh, like mid-year, like I think this summer. And he did a little talk and um, you can scan that QR code. It'll take you to the YouTube video of his talk. And it's really compelling because, you know, he. I think he charts out something that um, it, it's hard to argue with. It's this uh, idea that um, that this this general intelligence um, or what we think of as general intelligence isn't going to just be a thing, one thing. It's going to be how a, an entity a network works together. Um, and uh, 
he, he's challenging everyone in this hackathon to really think about that in terms of what they're learning and what they're exploring and what they're building. Um, and that's, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep that going here. Um, I, I believe as many other people, um, you know, I work at data stacks. This is one of the things that we talk about all the time internally. Um, I work on the Cassandra project. This is something that we've talked about internally, not internally. There's no internal in the Apache um, project. It's all external, all on the mailing list, but it's a very fascinating thing for people who work with data because it is going to open up a bunch of problems. And those problems are this idea of these large scale networks, um, which we've done, right? It's not an unusual thing. Uh, large scale uh, networks, agent networks are still within the boundaries of what we do in computer science. It's just how they work. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in the 19 early, well, no, it was mid 1990s, 96, I think, 97. Um, I was working with a uh, with one of our professors on a project for agents, and it was so clunky. Uh, it was all done. Uh, I'd used, yeah, I was writing C plus plus code and on Sun Microsystems, and we bound we bound up just abandoning the project because it just wasn't working. It was way too early. It didn't work that great. It was cool. Um, it was meant to be for commodities training, uh, but the problem was is that it required a lot of things like that shared context. They needed to be dynamic and they need to be able to make decisions. And you can't hard code logic that well for something that you want to act autonomously. Um, and it's only because rules change all the time. So um, I want to, if you've never worked with Cassandra or you didn't know that Cassandra is currently being shaped for generative AI workloads, let me introduce you. So like I said, I'm a Cassandra committer, work on the project all the time. I can go on and on about this, but I just want to give you a quick thing. Woo, we were so excited. So people working on the Cassandra project were so excited when Gen AI took off because it's a workload that we were built to do. Um, this distributed, um, very high, like this high scale, uh, resilient, oh, all those things we've been building for the past 10 or 12 years uh, totally hit. It's like, yes, um, you know, we we are well known for having a uh, really resilient database for web style workloads like banks and insurance companies, that sort of thing. But now this is such a cool new thing. And it's just because we we know, you know, this is what we've been working on is how do we make a database that does this. And it's funny because it's kind of faded into the background. People don't talk about it a ton unless you're using it all the time, but it is pretty much running the world right now. So many places. Um, if you are using a uh, a mobile phone, a mobile device, you're using Cassandra. And I don't care what mobile device you're using. You're probably using it every day, all day. Um, and based on that experience that we had, we keep thinking about this, oh, you know, what do, what do agents need? And thinking in terms of like, uh, just having that shared context, that invincible brain and the, the qualities of data and uptime and distribution are really critical for this next generation of workloads. And I'm going to explain why I think that's true here in a minute. Um, but we've, we've gone down this path um, before just with different workloads. Now we have a new workload and we have some adjustments to make. And I think this is a nice diagram. Thank you, Midjourney, um, for making this for me. I love Midjourney, by the way. I could just like, now is I could just dream up some stupid, like most of these diagrams, except for like the all the uh, continents, um, most of this was generated by Midjourney. And I just love that world we're living in where I could just dream something up, type in a prompt and get something out of it. Um, <laughs> I believe the prompt for the robot was a stoked robot. <laughs> Look at him. He's like, woo. <laughs> so good. Um, but this is, this is like what I'm thinking of. It's like a, just like how we operate. Um, every time we want to do something with agents at scale, I think we should think of them at large scale and worldwide should be what it is. And we were already used to this. If I travel from San Francisco to London to Sydney, I expect the same playlist on my Netflix, right? It, it's not like I have to log into a brand new account. We just expect this and we should expect that with agents. Um, so there's five hard problems that we're looking at when it comes to, uh, especially around vector search 
and but especially especially in gen gen AI workloads. Um, and what what we're looking what we're considering is all of the things that we we think we can solve, but are really difficult to solve in gen AI. So first of all, it's the scale out capabilities. Um, they're just we just don't like building things with upper limits. Um, and that's that's a pretty hard problem, but one that we've been solving for a long time. Um, you the upper limit is when you run out of money for infrastructure, which is hilarious, but it's true. Um, and then there's this there's another thing that we've noticed is this garbage collection with indexes. And this has to do with vector search. Uh, as you're updating, it, it seems that the most of the vector search solutions that are out there now or have been are were built around this idea of batch processing. And the batch processing is you use some sort of process to create a ton of index or a ton of uh, embeddings, put them into some sort of system file system, probably like Parquet, S3, whatever. And then you index it and then do read many. So write once, read many. And that opens up some big problem areas. For instance, transactional workloads. Um, if you're constantly updating your index and you need to change it, that's a new problem because you don't want old information and vector indexing is got its own problem because it's really CPU intensive and it's doing different things. And so that's a problem. Um, effective use of disk. This says not only to do with the amount of volume we're talking about, you could blow out volumes really quickly with indexing, um, but the throughput, that's what limits our throughput. Uh, if you're going to do uh, gigabytes per second, um, terabytes per second, you know, these are numbers that are really big. You have to think about throughput down to the disk. And uh, that's that's hard, especially when you're in the middle of doing some CPU intensive things like indexing. Um, and for developers, composability is, a, is one of the issues as well. Um, you know, having these really well-developed predicates and not just doing uh, the uh, the ANN search, the approximate nearest neighbor search. And I bet you Chris is going to talk about that in a minute. But um, you know, those predicates are like, how do I mix things together? So approximate nearest neighbor search, along with some other terms inside of my where clause, that for those predicates, finding data faster. And this is just the fundamental of computer science. You the way you get faster queries is when you limit the scope of the query. And um, there is more to what need what's needed in, in Gen AI, which is the hybrid search. Uh, and then finally, and this is the big one we're really working on hard right now, is concurrency. I mentioned before that this is the indexes that are out there, like phase, for instance, were around were built on the idea of uh, indexing data that's at rest and not thinking too much about concurrency issues such as updating transactional data as quickly as possible. And a lot of them are single threaded. Um, example would be uh, Lucene's HNSW. Actually, most HNSW implementations are single threaded. Um, and when that happens, the uh, HNSW is an algorithm. Sorry if I'm just throwing out terms here. Uh, HNSW is uh, a, a search algorithm for indexing for ANN, um, which is very common, very useful, is, is what they um, implemented in uh, Lucene, but it doesn't work in that single thread. And there's better ways to do this. Uh, so we're thinking hard about that. And there's a link in here um, that goes into more of this. Uh, Long-term Cassandra committer and PMC member, um, Jonathan Ellis is actually, this is his life right now is working on this problem. And the thing that he built is this really cool uh, library called JVector. It's an open source vector, uh, vector indexing library. Um, and it, what's there's a couple of cool things about it. First of all, it's Java. It's not Python. Whoa. <laughs> and um, thanks, Chris, for those, those links. Um, but uh, JVector is a new implementation it's from scratch. It uses it. It's inspired by the disk ANN paper from Microsoft, uh, which is now it seems to be everyone's looking at that and using it. It also uses the latest, uh, latest stuff from the JVM, which is using Panama and SIMD, which greatly increases things. Um, there's some uh, binary quantize, quantization that's happening soon. You'll see that in the library soon. Um, and if you, 
I'm sorry if that's a new word as well, that BQ binary quantization is really just a way to compress the index to make it faster. And um, these are all things that are happening fast. And it's so interesting that it's being, it's trending. It's like the number one Java repo right now in GitHub and it keeps trending because it's fascinating and it's fast and it's efficient. So, and that's what's being, that's currently in our DataStacks Astra, which is our cloud Cassandra service and uh, in Cassandra 5 Alpha 2, which just got released last week. So um, this is uh, this is a cool, one of your cool things to look at if you're interested. Thanks, Chris, for finding that. And here's the, here's the graph that shows the concurrency problem in numbers. And we keep doing these and they keep getting better with JVector. And it's just because of this concurrency issue. Um, if you look at the numbers, this is what, what Pinecone uses, uh, uses indexing uh, algorithms that are not optimized for update. And so you, and you can see this, and this is not just Pinecone. This is about every vector database that's out there um, is uh, during like PG vector does the same thing. Um, Pinecone, whenever it's indexing, the throughput just drops like a rock because it's, it's putting all its, its uh, CPU power to the indexing. And then whenever it's indexed, then it's fine again, it's fast. So, um, it, it really makes you want you to get the performance you need. You have to write your data and then go read it. And if there's any concurrency, you're in trouble. Well, we built JVector around the idea of concurrency is always going to be a problem. So there's, there's no difference between live data and index data. And this is actually a problem we solved about eight years ago in Cassandra about how to index live data. Uh, and we're just moving it forward and it's very reliable. And we just keep doing this with like, this is another HNSW implementation. Um, we found, and yay open source, we found a really cool thing that is is something we could solve. And we're doing that right now. So uh, we're we are looking uh, to the future. We're moving faster now. There are some, some optimizations that are gonna make this even faster. Like, the numbers I've seen are even two or four times faster than the current implementation, but um, we're we're pretty solidly up there. And this is a Java library doing some really cool at scale stuff. So if you're a Java developer, you can you can laugh a little bit because now Python people are looking backwards again. Um, all right, let's see. So this is what we're we we're trying to make this are like a big thing for us right now. And this is just a show, showing during ingest index and query, there's no uh, concurrency issues right now. Um, so we can, because Cassandra has been built around this for so long, um, we, we've we this was an easy one for us to tackle and we are. Um, and why this is all, this is, this is a cost thing that we're trying to go after. We, we wanna make things, this is what, makes it cheaper, <laughs> you know? So when you get response uh, that's that's faster for less cost than overall, because for Cassandra workloads, we're used to petabyte, terabyte, millions of writes per second, those kind of numbers. And when you get into those numbers, things start to count. Um, you know, even if it's a small little incremental cost per transaction, it, it will add up. And, you, you know, this is like, uh, when you look at things like transfer rates between clouds, um, that has been the thing that no one likes to talk about, but it's like, it adds up really quickly. It can be the most expensive part of your bill, right? Because you don't think about it as like, oh, I just moved a terabyte from one region to another. Wow, that was expensive. Well, you don't think about it until you do it at scale. We we're thinking about it at scale. Um, and then the number that uh, it's interesting, um, uh, zero delay. No, we have not exceeded the speed of light. Zero delay meaning that it should not be, and there should not be an indexing cost. If you insert the data and it's committed, it should be immediately available. Once you get a commit signal, then it should be available in the index. It shouldn't be. And the delay that is typical is that you get, you once you commit the data, it may take five, 10 seconds to actually show up in an index. That's the delay I'm talking about. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> I will never, ever say we broke the speed of light. Um, I, I, I believe in physics still. Um, but the the thing that we're, uh, we should probably talk about, which doesn't get talked about, in, we, this is a new thing for database people, um, 
is, you know, we talk about things like latency and throughput, but another measurement now that's really relevant for, especially for um, Gen AI workloads is this relevancy. And when, and it's a funny thing, because usually with indexes, we're doing, uh, we could do fuzzy matches. Okay, that's close. Uh, we do exact where we say this equals that. But when we get into relevancy, we're like, yeah, give me all the things that are close. But because it's an approximate nearest neighbor, that A can be very, very bad because you could have you could have a really good set of data that should give you really good results if you say, hey, does this picture look like that picture? Or how many pictures look like this? You won't know how bad it is if you don't have a good relevancy. You may not, you could put up a picture of a hot dog and get a picture and, and it'll say, oh yeah, it looks exactly like this ice cream cone. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's relevancy. And this is something that is is difficult, but it takes um, it takes CPU to basically create this. Um, there's only one way to do good nearest neighbor to like the perfect, and that's called you know that that's um, your KNN, which is a Spark job. So you have to look at all your data, rank it, sort it. That's a KNN job. So if you do Spark, you'll get exact that. But um, we uh, we're you know we as an industry are look are doing ANN so relevancy is how good is that approximation so that's something we've been and we've been doing nothing but optimizing for that so there's a lot there's a lot on the slide that I'm kind of sidebarring on but it's important that we all have the same terms so some of the use cases um, I want to call out sorry open uh, open AI but LMs and let's talk about what, how they fit into our world. And I think there is a, a general perception uh, that LLMs are like the new Google. I can ask an LLM anything and it'll give me an answer, but we know <laughs> we've heard plenty of stories of how that went. Um, and it's because LLMs are really good communicators. Uh, they can, you know, if you are, if you need to communicate in a language, like a, a a, any human language or a computer language like uh, code, they're really good at composing languages and communicating, but they're also really good at reasoning, which is not something that was the original goal, but they are. They're really good at reasoning. Um, the thing that they're terrible at is knowing things, and they can. They can know things. Uh, that is possible, but um, the the whole the whole knowing things is up in the air. Um, and if we've all had fun with hallucinations, if you, if you want to have a lot of fun, go ask chat DBT to write a resume for you. And uh, the ones that I have had it write me are humorous because eventually just starts wandering off. And it's because, uh, whenever we have, uh, whenever we have knowledge that's embedded in there, it's doing an optimization to give you a really awesome answer. Either, even if it's not right. So, you know, it's just, it says the wrong thing with so much confidence, but there's ways to fix this, right? <clears throat> oh, Todd, when I say Spark, I mean Apache Spark. Yes, thanks, Chris. Yes, this is this is a large scale batch job. Um, <clears throat> oh God, I hope this isn't Todd Burris. Um, the multi-turn autonomous agents in this case, and when we talk about how to get past this like when we say all right how do we get past hallucinations it's just a, a technique and the when we so getting back to the original point i was saying like ai agents are going to be doing a lot of the work those ai agents are going to need two things to work well and that is a, a large language model which provides a lot of the the i guess the smarts you could say but then the vector databases are now holding what's the real knowledge and in a way that's usable and consumable by an LLM. And that's in these embeddings and combined, they make for these really good, um, they make for really good models that uh, give you the truth or at least give you the accuracy. Let's say, I hate to say truth because truth is somewhat ambiguous as well. Accurate results. So um, if I ask a question, I'm going to get some data out. And we've seen this, we've seen this chat with my data. You know, you put in a PDF and you ask questions of the PDF. Well, that PDF was vectorized and, you know, put into embeddings. The LLM, you use it to essentially create the query. You feed it data 
to ask you know, when you're asking questions from the vector embeddings, and then they combine those two things and give you an answer. And that answer is based on the data in the PDF. Cool. Um, so the this this is actually a very common pattern. Um, you probably heard this a hundred times at this point. If not, it's called RAG. Um, and the 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 point of RAG and there's there's a few others that are out there. But RAG is really um, the, the retrieval augmented generation is about combining vectors and LLMs and to give you the best answer possible. But it's also to control uh, the, the hallucinations a bit, to give it, keep it on task, right? Um, <clears throat> and you you want to keep your, your LLM from wandering. But a lot of times, um, you know, the, the thing about RAG that's really important is that it it lets you focus your like your chat bot or your whatever you're using your agent on a certain domain and that domain is growing this multimodal domain uh chat gpt has some pretty cool stuff and i think chat gpt is a great example or you know, poc whatever you want to call it. it gives us an idea of what's what's possible and it's so easy to use right but just recently, you know, they had this thing where you could upload a picture and they had a really cool example. They took a picture of a bike and they're like, how do I adjust the seat? That is so cool. So, um, but that's multimodal, right? It was able to look at the picture, understand that this is a bike, understand that you're asking about a seat and then reason through an answer and probably pulling some information from somewhere to say, oh, this is how you do it. Um, <clears throat> that multimodal is getting closer to how humans work. And I don't know if you've used the audio version of ChatGPT where you could talk to it. Uh, spoiler alert, super chatty, but it works. Um, these are the modes, right? And there will be more modes. And those modes are going to create a ton of data. Uh, and the data, 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 data. If you've been working in this industry for more than five years, you know that Every time we have a paradigm shift with applications and how we build them, it usually comes with just as much data behind it. And uh, I love this graph that comes up all the time, like, oh, we're, there's so much data we're going to have. We're going to have zettabytes of data. And it always looks exponential. And it always is more than they ever pr predict, right? And it's because these transformers, see, that's Optimus Prime, um, those transformers are going to use more data. Um, <laughs> I'm no, no more gridlock. No more gridlock. Sorry, Ed. Sorry, Ed. Okay. Okay. I, I'm moving fast. I know. <laughs> so, but let's think about it in terms of building apps that do the thing that we want. And the thing that we want is we want to be able to use our data. We want to communicate with humans and we want to reason through things without having complicated logic, like writing if then blocks. Um, and so how do we do that? And think about the cool things that are now happening. Like I could do a chat. Great. But agents, and I have an example of an agent in a minute, um, but agents are going to do things like go book me a vacation. And that, whew, I, think about what that means. Or just buy me a pizza. They're just, hey, I'm not going to say the word. But Siri, um, buy me a pizza. Think of all the things that need to happen to make that. First of all, you're going to give your credit card to some some agent. Okay, that's a test. But there's a lot to know there. And so this is a this is a somewhat complicated, but not diagram of the, how generative AI apps are, will be and will be continue are being and will continue to be built. The user prompt goes into is turns into an embedding model. Um, that goes through an LLM that's stored in a vector, uh, the vector database stores all this application data. And then we do things like Flare, which is forward looking. For instance, if I ask a question about say a bicycle seat, it's gonna have to reason through all those things. If I say, hey, order my normal pizza. Think about all those words that I just put in front of a computer. Wait a minute, normal pizza? And if I'm ordering it, where would I order it? Oh. There's some context in there. I say, oh, you usually get pizza from Mambo's and Mambo's, this is your normal pizza at Mambo's is the Mambo Zombo. Okay, because this is all context and it has to put all this together. But if if we have history, 
and the LLM is able to communicate, then it can reason and say, okay, I'm going to order a Mambo Zombo for Mambo's and I'm going to have it picked up because he's in his car and he can drive over there and pick it up. Like all that stuff is happening. Well, it needs data. None of that's going to get stored in LLM. None of it. Because LLMs are the most expensive way to store data. And it's it's just too dynamic. What if I change my regular pizza, right? <laughs> um, so, and eventually what happens is it goes back to the user. And when it goes back to the user, it's in a human context. Like, so when I asked Siri to do that for me, I wanted to come back and say, you got it. Your pizza will be ready at 550. Head on over. I just paid for it. All you need to do is pick it up. I even left a nice tip. What a great, that's like, uh, that's, that's what I want. That, Iron Man had that. I want that. But all of those, if we reason through all those steps, you realize that that's incredibly complicated, but within reach right now. There's contextual data that we store over time, but should be local, meaning I control it. And then LLMs that can control the communication back and forth, right? And yeah, and I'm not going to help you with that, but uh, you're right. <laughs> well, I want the my Apple Watch to tell me that I'm hungry and then order a pizza for me. Oh God, you know that's coming, right? But yeah, like, this is within this is within reason. We're we're going to see this within the next couple of years, right? So so effective, efficient RAG is key, and this is why we're really working hard at making J Vector and our vector search so much faster because people do store an enormous amount of data in uh, in vector databases and will continue to do it. And Cassandra has been a great choice for that. And we're gonna continue to do that. It's just happening. Um, and we're going to increase relevancy because the last thing I want is not a Mambo Zombo. If I said, hey, I'm hungry, order my normal pizza and I show up and it's a hot dog, I'm gonna be really upset. I want relevant results um, and cost-effective. We're gonna do this at scale. Uh, it's not gonna be one person, it's going to be millions or billions of people it has to be cost effective and i said i had an example um the the whole uh chat thing this is uh this is actually running in our system now this is uh, an astro which is our cassandra's a service but it's a, this thing Priceline thing. It's contextual to the person and it's really cool i love this app it's a chat app but it's like um it's my first visit to uh, new york is this this property in a good location well, it has to know what you booked and it knows all these things and it can answer the question. So this is a just a taste of what's out there, but but this is an example of someone who wants to do this at scale. Every, every one of their customers is gonna probably use this eventually. And so we're working with them to make that happen. It's production, it's production data. It's not new, it's just newer, just a new use case. We're just gonna keep moving forward. We're all professionals here. Uh, you can try this out today. I got to give the plug, got to pay the bills, but this is super simple. And the free tier is awesome. Runs on Amazon. Um, there you go, Chris. We're actually really, uh, we were deep partners with Amazon. So, um, if you have, uh, your, all your workloads in Amazon, we have so many things to help you out. We're great partners with Amazon on running your cloud, Cassandra, and all connecting with all the services. Um, we just announced a really cool integration with uh, Amazon Bedrock, et cetera. So um, I would, I would. this is the thing I'm going to challenge you. Go try out Astra. We just released a new user interface for Vector. It is, the I think, the best user interface for using Vectors. It explains it. It makes it easy. It keeps it, it just very light. But you can build a RAG application within a few minutes. It's really cool. Um, and final, final shameless plug. I know everyone's probably going to be at reInvent, but right after, um, in San Francisco, well, I'm sorry, San, San Jose, the AI.dev conference and the Cassandra summit are on December 12th and 13th. Um, I, I there's a code here if you want to use it, uh, or I could put it in the chat, but, uh, it's 20% off. It, the early bird ends tomorrow. So that's why I'm like, hey, go do this. And it's it's a pretty affordable summit. It's going to be massive. I mean, this is this is a practitioner summit. So it's all open source. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens there. Uh, but it's going to be because it's a run by the Linux Foundation and it's open source, there's going to be companies there that you never hear uh, hear from usually, like the Apples, the Bloombergs, the Netflixes, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so 
Uh, it is an in-person, there is some virtual, um, but it is an in-person um, summit in San Jose. So I hope to see you there. You should sign up, go do it now. And Chris, that's all I have. And I bet you I got a lot of questions. I saw Ann's question in there, crack me up. <laughs> yeah. And is, uh, yeah, she's she's quite silly. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Patrick, there's maybe a couple questions. If you scroll up a little bit, uh, if you can sure. take those offline. Um, and let me, uh, we got about 15 minutes left. So I will I'm use gonna... the, I'm sorry. I just, I, you said take your time. I did. I was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I no, I mean, to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's perfect timing because I will have 15 minutes of material. So let me grab this. All right, I'll kill my, kill my screen and then I'll start answering questions. Yeah, dude. Great talk, by the way. Um, I actually didn't get to see your talk um, at one of the recent conferences. I got pulled into something else. So I was well, there's your makeup. To see that. That's the makeup. Okay. Um, and here's the talk here. So we're going to talk a little bit about Langchain, everyone's favorite uh, framework. We're going to talk about what this is. Let me grab. Let me do, let me do this here. Hopefully it works. Okay. Everyone can see my screen, I assume. Patrick, can you see my screen? Purple. Yep. You and I see your parrot. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> the famous Lang Chain parrot. Okay. So for full disclosure, this presentation was actually built by some of my peers. Um, one of those peers just left Amazon, the guy that was supposed to be. <laughs> so I took over his talk with his permission. Uh, and um, I'm going to run through basically kind of uh, what is Langchain? How do we use it? There is code in here. There, There is um, you know, things about how to reason through and agents. And so we'll get into all of this, uh, really the high level value prop of something like Langchain um and some of the basic building blocks and we'll talk about privacy and content moderation and how to debug these things and even some use cases what is langchain langchain is a framework designed for building applications powered by llms now langchain has actually rebranded a bit in that they are really a context aware reasoning application builder. So building context aware reasoning applications. So the, the, the focus here is just like Patrick was saying is actually on the reasoning aspect of these LLMs. And the thinking here is that when you can reason through problems and questions, you can break them up into multiple um, steps or you can reason through, you know, which APIs to call and uh, which, you know, vector stores to pull from or which database to pull from. And so there's a lot of power, but really comes down to the reasoning aspect here. All right. Uh, this is not a real business friendly value proposition, uh, but this is what we have here. So, you know, Langchain, very, very modular, by the way, uh, very, very well well-architected, in my personal opinion. Uh, there's a lot of abstractions. Now, Langchain gets a lot of uh, criticism for potentially being bloated or for potentially requiring a whole lot of code and a relatively high uh, learning curve um, to do something that seems so simple. And if you recall, you know, uh, Patrick and I are, you know, old old Java um, hacks, you know, um, I actually kind of like frameworks and frameworks get people to, to speak the same language. Frameworks, you know, provide extensibility, they provide consistency. Um, and so from, you know, my standpoint, a very well architected uh, system is a, you know, very good thing. Some of the more modern, you know, Python hackers, I'll say, you know, just like to bang out code and, you know, yeah, why am I writing? or like using this framework when all I have to do is just call an API or, you know, write my own implementation. And that's fine. You can certainly, you know, uh, so Langchain is open source. You can actually go into Langchain, look at the code if you want to, grab the code and just use that. Um, but I think a, you know, potentially better way to kind of look at this is that you're not just solving the problem today, but there's going to be other problems that you want to solve. And uh, if, you, if you stick to the Langchain framework itself and the constructs, you will also gain access to future features that uh, Langchain offers. In fact, I had gone on um, on a vacation for like three days. And when I came back, I noticed Langchain added this whole um, 
right? Uh, this very last bullet point here about the about the evaluations, and this is huge. So the you know now we can use LangChain to actually run evaluations using you know GPT four, uh, using Bedrock, using anything, um, and um, set baselines for our uh, like models, and then be able to fine tune those models and continue to run the same evals. So uh, if you were not buying into the lang chain, you would then have to go off and, and sort of build your own eval framework. So I'm a big proponent. There's also, of course, you know, visualizations. There's also prompt management, which is becoming very, very critical these days. Prompts are you know, how we are interacting with these, these reasoning applications and these LLMs. So very important. Um, and so this is where the criticism comes in is, you know, oh gosh, like what's all, what's happening here? There's, there's lots of these components. There's uh, the different modules, utilities and agents and output parsers and schema. And, you know, why do I have to do all this? All I want to do is just pass some text in with an F string in Python and, you know, parameterize it and then get the data back and, and parse it. But as you start to build more and more applications, and as I work with more and more customers, these things get relatively complex, right? We're doing uh, vector stores, we're creating embeddings, we have to load documents and chunk them up, and um, you know, um, and things get like pretty complicated. And also, if you do want to, you know, use some of the AWS stuff, we have been contributing to the LangChain project to implement like Lambda. We have DynamoDB for the chat history. Um, and so, you know, once again, when you have a framework, you can then like start to rely on cloud providers like us, cloud providers like Azure, Google to then implement these um, basic interfaces, these like high level interfaces to do the cloud specific things. Okay. And the, you know, high level use cases here, RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation like Patrick covered. Um, I'd say probably a, a very large majority of my customers are doing summarization. Um, a few are doing their own chatbots for customer support. Starting to see a lot more tabular data. Uh, folks, you know, these customers have data uh, not just sitting in an S3 bucket or, you know, on a disk somewhere like, like a raw unstructured data, like a PDF, but they're also wanting to reason not just from the unstructured data PDFs, but also combine it with the data that they have sitting in a database. So we're seeing quite a lot of that. Um, and then also APIs, right? Uh, people have huge investment in, you know, microservices, folks like Netflix, right? Like all these, um, and um, of course, right, like Amazon, um, which kind of helped start the whole microservice craze back in the day, back in the early Jeff Bezos days. Uh, so we have lots of, of these microservices, lots of APIs. How can we include those APIs in our reasoning applications? And then, of course, the last one here, evaluation, which is probably what I spend most of my time working with customers on throughout all of these use cases. We need to do the evaluation for RAG. We have to do evaluation for summary. Uh, we have to do evaluations on our chatbots and question answer and, you know, even um, uh, querying these APIs and tabular data. So here's how you pip install it. Uh, this version, I think, is out of date. It's I think we're up to 300, 400 now. Uh, if you are not familiar with LangChain, uh, the, just know that this um, gets bumped in versions probably two or three times a day in, in some cases. So you might start the day on version 275 and when you finish, uh, you'll see that link chain is already up to 279 you know, or 285 or whatever. All right, let's dive into some of the specific modules here. So we've got the IO models. Uh, this is where you're gonna see, um, of course, the like LLMs because that's what we're going to pass inputs into, we're going to take the output from the LLM, we're going to parse it with a output parser. Okay, And of course, let's do it in the context of a chat model, for example, and here we have Amazon Bedrock, OpenAI, we have Anthropic Claude, AI21 Jurassic. Um, embeddings, this is, as Patrick was talking about, this is what we're going to be doing, the approximate nearest neighbor searches on where we first have to create the embeddings, right? And so that's where you would use something like Bedrock. Um, also, Cohere has a really good embedding uh, model as well, which is not listed here, but uh, Cohere, definitely one of our uh, Bedrock partners. 
Um, the other thing as well, and I think I uh, have my camera on here, but this book is super good. The async IO uh, and Python book. I actually got this at a thrift store, which is funny enough. It got some scratches and dings and um, I, I could have bought it off Amazon, but I just thought it was good. I'm, I'm a sustainable uh, book reader here. So um, using async IO in Python, obviously async IO in Java libraries as well. Um, and that's really what you want to become proficient in is, you know, doing these things in an async manner as much as possible. Also, there's some other optimizations here. Uh, caching, I'm starting to see this quite a lot. Combining caching with the approximate nearest neighbor searches with, with um, like semantic searching. So consider someone asked a question and you've already um answered a similar question that the like LLM can determine is is similar or using uh, these embedding searches approximate near, um, uh, like nearest neighbor um, asking a question one way and then asking that same question slightly differently we can actually just go into our cache and pull out the same answer and so I'm starting to see a lot more you know as we're getting into uh, the sort of day day one and day two of uh, or you know more day two with these generative models, I'm I'm starting to see more and more companies building in these optimizations. Uh, doing batch calls, of course, you know batches like batch meaning I can batch up um, multiple requests. So at scale, you know, think of your uh, chatbot being able to answer you know ten questions sequentially versus just doing one at a time, one at a time. So. Um, also streaming, we're very familiar with this using ChatGPT, using, um, yeah, so Bedrock also supports uh, streaming responses, which is very cool. It, it's what kind of gives you the uh, lower perceived latency, right? So maybe you're not getting the full answer back right away, but you are streaming the answer. Um, and uh, supporting bring your own LLMs as well too. So not just these providers. Now, at, at this point in time, I'll be very honest, uh, Langchain does have a, a a tendency to support OpenAI um, first for lots of, of their features. Um, however, we do work with the founders and the um, uh, like top engineers over at um, at the uh, like Langchain company, and we are working with them more closely to have Bedrock and Anthropic and AI twenty one actually supported out of the box when these new features are released. Okay. So real quick, you know, this is how you would get a bedrock model in um, here. We're going to use the Amazon Titan model here. Um, and, you know, here's how you set up your like AWS profile and, you know, bedrock um, uh, stuff here. And it's actually a little bit simpler than it looks here. This is kind of expanding it out uh, to show sort of all the different options here. But uh, at, at the end of the day, we are creating what's called a Langchain LLM uh, bedrock class here in Python. And then we are invoking that, calling the predict with this prompt. Now, this prompt here is just a simple prompt. Uh, we're just asking it to complete this sentence. So this is what's called a completion. Um, and uh, here, the um, highest uh, probability completion is as quick as a rabbit for, um, so yeah, the word rabbit here is what we're actually completing, okay? Very simple example. Now, we can start to get more and more complicated. Uh, this is probably the part where people get all uh, crazy about, you know, why do I have to use this framework when all I'm really doing is an F string? So here we're combining these parameters and I can parameterize the word product or the variable product, give it colorful socks, combine it with a prompt template uh, and then together it actually creates, you know, fills in. Um, so think of it like F-string, sure, that's fine. There will be more complicated things coming here in a bit. This is just scratching the surface here. Uh, calls it, it, it will then pass this into the LLM and then um, finds the uh, completion. We can also have it parse the output to turn this into JSON, uh, which is very powerful. Okay, more, here's some more prompt templates. Going to kind of skip over these. It's you know really basic, uh, just creating this template and then parameterizing it. Uh, output parsers also you know relatively straightforward, um, and you know I do encourage you to try out these things. If they don't get in the way too much, um, I would stick with them. Um, but and this actually is using Pydantic, 
uh, and Pinantic, you know, gives us some some nice benefits here to uh, validate the data types. All right, chain. So the word Langchain include or the name Langchain implies that there's some sort of chain here, uh, and these are sequences of calls to these different components. And you know, here's some of the uh, components. In particular, the memory component can remember, um, you know, conversations, uh, sessions. Um, you can essentially have a single session open with the chatbot and continue to add, um, you know, more and more statements within there um, using memory. There's callbacks. Callbacks are very powerful. Um, check out some of the, the uh, callbacks here. Things like the ability to count the number of tokens going in, the number of tokens coming out, all kinds of things, which is useful for, you know, cost uh, like analysis. And then, yeah, so we can actually do sequential chains. Um, and here's some of these example chains, conversation chains, uh, there's routers. Uh, there's also MapReduce. Now, you know, MapReduce, if you come from the Hadoop world, this term makes sense. If not, you know, um, let's see, I think I have an example here of the MapReduce. Uh, well, yeah, let's first cover the sequential chain here. So we can do a synopsis chain that's gonna, you know, like essentially, uh, do a summary of um, of a uh, here it's for the above play uh, and then we could take the output of that and sequentially pass it into the next chain and so you could have different groups within your uh, like organization that are building these change that chains that are specialists and then you can combine them um, and uh, so take the the output of the first chain pass it into the second chain pretty basic uh, and okay, yeah, let's cover retrieval here. Yeah, I already saw quite a lot of this in Patrick's talk, but just know that if you are gonna be doing any RAG, you have to first get the data into your vector store. And that's you, so there's a whole set of uh, components and you know modules around getting data into your uh, vector store. And it's CSV, as simple as CSV, as complicated as Snowflake. I tend to use the PyPDF loader quite a bit. Um, I use Excel loader. Um, you can, you know, go old school and do some like XML. You can pass it a URL. It'll, uh, you know, pull pull that data in from the website. Uh, the other thing is you want to be able to split this data. So you'll see these three chunks here. So if you have one gigantic document, you really want to split up these documents and. Um, you know, store these separately. And so this gives you the ability to really just retrieve the most relevant chunk. So maybe one and three and not have to pull in the entire document. And, um, you know, so this is where the semantic search comes in, the approximate nearest neighbor, things like JVector that can do these much, much, um, right, like quicker than if you were just going to use like a leucine index and do keyword searches. And so what we're doing here with RAG is we are um, on the admin side of it, sort of the, the data loading side, we are chunking these up. Now, the chunk size is a hyperparameter to your RAG, um, to this whole process. So you, you will very likely not get the chunk size correct on the first try. And this is something that we like iterate with our customers on quite a bit. Um, and you could do it by characters, by number of tokens, by uh, lines of code, you know, depending on what the data looks like. Ultimately, this gets stored into a vector store. Um, we should probably add Cassandra JVector here uh, to this list. Um, what we see lots of customers doing that are, um, you know, primarily Amazon or, or have an existing open search cluster for their keyword searches and for their Lucene. They tend to use Amazon Open Search. Um, we do see people using Pinecone, of course, one of our great partners, seeing people also using uh, Cassandra and JVector these days as well, too. We have all kinds of different um, embedding options. So you could use Bedrock, which has access to Cohere. You could use Cohere directly. You can use uh, Anthropic. Actually, I don't know for sure if, if Anthropic offers embeddings. I Thought they did, but maybe not. Now that I think about it, Open AI, you can use Hugging Face model directly. Um, you can use Vertex AI, you know, from other cloud providers. Um, I tend to use the Bedrock ones because they are pretty good. 
Um, if, if they don't work for you, try out the hugging face or even try the open AI ones as well too. Um, just get it working for your system. And, and then on the retriever side, so there, so this is the sort of admin side is what I call it. This is getting the data into your vector store when you're actually, you know, real time doing your chatbot or, or, you know, trying to answer people's questions. Uh, you need these retrievers and we have some for Amazon Kendra. Um, you know, uh, we have a like web research retriever. This would, you know, be doing Google searches, for example. And then of course we have the retriever from the vector store. And again, that will retrieve the most relevant chunks and add that to the prompt that gets sent in uh, to your LLM. All right. So here's kind of everything coming together again on the left side is the sort of admin side. Here's a Pi PDF loader. We've got some, you know, some Amazon shareholder letter, for example. Here we're going to split. Uh, I almost always use the recursive character text splitter. Seems to work really well. Here's our chunk size. Um, we then, once we actually have the splits, we can then create the embeddings using Bedrock um, and you know something like Titan for the embeddings. And then on the retrieval. Oh, so actually this is still on the like admin side. So upper right here where we're actually loading in all of those chunks into our index and it's then going. So here we're actually using just a simple in memory on disk uh, sort of local one called FICE uh, stands for uh, Facebook AI uh, similarity search or, or something I believe is the two S's. This is by Facebook. It's really a... Uh, vector store library. Um, it's 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 very powerful, but it's only you know single node. So you you can't essentially have this spread across you know multiple. Now, Amazon Open Search actually implements Fice, and so that's what gives you distributed capabilities where you could scale your vector store across multiple nodes and have um, your uh, right like HA the high availability and and all those good things. Okay, and then when you're actually going to perform some some kind of reasoning or some query, what you now do is then switch over and you can query the index, giving it the LLM to do the reasoning and you can then get the answers, all right? Uh, everyone's favorite topic, agents. Um, the, the Langchain folks are the first folks to say that the term agent is very overloaded this day and age. Um, we actually bedrock uh, at like Amazon also have an agents concept as well, or a like implementation of agents that uses Lambda beneath the covers and, you know, um, has all of the Amazon security, IAM security model, all the enterprise features using AWS um, built in. However, we, we still do see customers choose to use Langchain, either they already have an existing um, uh, sort of infrastructure based around Langchain um, investments in Langchain. And some people are migrating over to the bedrock agents um, and some people just like continue to use the link chain stuff. So really this, this is at a, a very high level. The first step is a query comes into this agent executor, which is really the orchestrator um, and talks to the LLM for the reasoning aspects. And then that LLM can reason through and figure out which of these tools is needed. Do if they're trying if the user is trying to get some data out of a SQL database or the um, actual LLM determines that the database is the best place to get one part of the data, it'll pull the data from there. It can then um, sort of reason through and figure out, okay, now I have to use the results to perform an average or a sum uh, or some type of, of you know mathematical calculation. So it can use a calculator API or a you know calculator.py file. Um, and, you know, what if we also have to leave our environment to do a web search to get the latest news from today? You know, what is Sam Altman doing today? Did he show up to his first day of work? Is he taking PTO or, um, you know, paid time off? Uh, is he traveling? You know, what's going on? Um, okay. And really these, this, these agents are, are and, and same with the like Amazon Bedrock agents, they're based on this React. Um, concept and uh, you know React is covered in our book. It's also covered in our Coursera course with uh, deep learning. React is also a paper um, and it stands for reasoning and action. 
And so really what's happening here is we are creating um, this chain of thought where it's like, okay, what is the action? What is the input to the action? What did we observe when we performed the action? And actions can be querying a database, can be searching the internet, could be calling calculator.py. What, what is the thought that I now have after um, observing what I observed from the action and then, you know, potentially go to the next chain or at, you know, minimum finish this chain and provide the final answer, okay? So here's another way to look at it. Answer, you know, here's like the query. Um, number two is uh, this is the tool uh, or this is the actual um, agent that I want to invoke, which is I need to do a search, um, a, you know, calculator. Uh, so, and then, Here's where the thought, action, action, input, observation, thought, final response. This is sort of the you know high level framework or template of what's happening when you invoke agents. The whole idea, by the way, is to get the results. So you know, final answer from this agent. Here's a calculator, and that's going to then feed into the next chain or the next set of of um, of like reasoning, right? So. Here's a quick one that just you know loads LLM math. Uh, we've got a bedrock model that can do some math here and um, uh, we can invoke the agent. Debugging, this is my favorite part about Langchain. This is where if you go off and, and write your own Langchain or decide Langchain is too bloated for you, this is where you're really gonna miss out because when you participate in the Langchain um, sort of uh, like ecosystem, you you get access to um, you know different ways to debug, uh, ways to trace. Um, you could do object level debugging. You could do you know custom callbacks that that where you can augment the debugging that's happening. Um, there's this tool called LangSmith. Now LangSmith Smith is I believe the paid product um, for you know LangChain. But to me, Lang Smith really ties everything together and really highlights the benefits of uh, participating in this framework. This has really, really saved me quite a lot, you know, the ability to drill in and to see, you know, where is my chain going off the rails? Where can I, or, you know, I could see the actual inputs going in, the prompts going into the LLM math chain, and I can debug. Uh, I could also see performance numbers here to see where am I spending the most time. Uh, and start to make optimizations. So, you know, um, and if you're using weights and biases, also a nice way to see what's going on there. All right, um, and I believe we're over time, but I'm gonna keep going. We're gonna, certainly gonna continue recording and I'll, I'll post the video. I think I have about four or five slides left here. Uh, designing robust lane chain applications. Um, obviously with any system that you're building, you want monitoring, you want the ability to scale uh, do batching, async. Um, also, you want to be able to iterate quickly, right? And so maybe you today want to use your own hugging face model um, or a local hugging face model, but you um, are having problems getting access to GPUs or something, and now you decide to switch over to use the Bedrock uh, version, and um, you can very easily swap in different implementations when you participate in Langchain. Uh, the other cool thing is infrastructure as code. So uh, Langchain does support Terraform, CloudFormation, um, and we're starting to see a lot more Kubernetes integration with Langchain as well. That'll probably be one of my follow-up talks in 2024 uh, because I do uh, quite a bit with, with uh, Kubernetes and Amazon EKS and um, gonna see how some of that comes together. Privacy content moderation. So here's another place where you could try out you know, different uh, ways to moderate and to flag, you know, not safe for work content or uh, things that you you don't necessarily want to be responsible for, you know, either answers coming out of the model or even the inputs going in. Uh, and so you could try different strategies. Um, so there's a service Amazon Comprehend that that does this. You can also use um, uh, right like providers like OpenAI. Uh, constitutional AI from the Anthropic folks. So there's a constitutional chain um, and then logical fallacy chain as well. Some of these are in experimental mode. Some of these are actually ready to go uh, full production. So I think this has been covered, but you know, 
the right like the assistance, the the chat assistance, uh, question and answer bot, um, the ability to summarize. You know, these aren't really Langchain specific; they're more sort of LLM specific uh, querying tabular data. Okay. So I think we already covered these. Here's here's the MapReduce, um, and what's happening here is <clears throat> this is the classic summary of a summary type of thing where you have a very very large corpus. So for example, running you know our book is, our new book is about three hundred twenty pages. We could pass this in. We could chunk it up. We can summarize maybe every chapter. Maybe we have one one chunk per chapter. Um, the we can use and do it in parallel where we summarize every chapter and that's the the map part of it and then the reduce part of it is where we could take all those summaries combine them and do one big summary and get uh, a you know summary of a summary for our book uh, and do it in parallel here's an example of combining the data that you get from a database with you know some data from uh, that's been put into your vector store, or in this case, into, into Kendra, um, and interacting with APIs. Let's see some of the extraction, um, just you know, ways to uh, use uh, JSON here. Okay, so a lot of this comes from these uh, references here, and I think we will uh, wrap it up. So, Patrick, if if you're still there, thanks a lot, man. For your time um i'm see. here and so. that was awesome I, that was some great one-on-one -on -one stuff yeah and yeah, yeah you should update your deck man put some cassandra and Astra in there for some vector store yeah <laughs> you know because we want everyone to be successful <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm just looking at the questions here uh... Yeah, and we'll uh, we will post the video to the link uh, that someone posted there. Regex lives on for sure. Okay, and I think yeah, Microsoft Auto Gen. Um, I haven't seen myself the Auto Gen um, framework. I haven't used it. I, there's some really cool things in there though from uh, what I see on the like GitHub page. Uh, what are your thoughts on virtual mem GPT? I don't know much about mem GPT and flow wise. Yeah, do you know any of these tools, Patrick? Yeah, have you gotten a chance? Flow wise, I mean, I'm trying to see where you're looking at. Um, I've used many. <laughs> uh, I'm using I'm using a Lamy index a lot right now. Um, are you okay? Yeah. Um, what is Lang Chain a lot? Uh, Lang Chain and Lama Index are really strong partners here at DataStacks. We do a lot of work together. Um, but yeah, the Flowwise is really interesting. Um, it creates chains as well. What's your experience? So when so when would you choose Lama Index? Uh, and I know you can use Lama Index with Lang Chain as well, right? There's some integrations there. Um, but yeah, yeah thoughts a, on that. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's, I think there's some preferential stuff going on and it's changing so quickly. You know, Link Chain was built around the idea of building chains. And so um, that's a strength is literal like agent chaining. Um, Lama Index seems to be dialing into this uh, building uh, like really hyper optimizing RAG applications. Um, they're, they're dialing really deeply into the, Type the TypeScript world, like they just released a library last week um, that lets you create a, a Next.js, you know, top down, back end, front end for a, a chat application, a RAG application. So um, I, I think it's going to be preferences like what, how do you want to consume it? It's, I can't say, oh, go use this for this reason and go use that for that reason. Um, it's going to be your develop like your development style and probably want to look at like the features that you need for your application. And if you don't know, go use both. It's easy. They both take like 10 minutes to get you started. Yeah. Here's the auto gen. I think I'm still sharing my screen. Yeah. I had checked this out when it first came out and then I um, got pretty busy with reinvent here. Yeah, there's yeah, some I really don't know cool... where Autogen is going. Uh, it, it's cool. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, again, I, I also work with Auto GPT team quite a bit. 
And, you know, so they're on a track. And so there's super agent auto GPT. I work with, uh, you know, that I've been working on that project quite a bit. Um, then auto gen, uh, is also in this world. I mean, it's a wild west. It's, there's so many interesting things. Auto GPT is fascinating. 153,000 stars on GitHub. Clearly they caught some attention. Wow. <laughs> Have you ever seen yeah. that many stars on a project? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Um, I'm on the huh. I'm on the Auto GPT Discord and it is lively. It looks like they have some. Oh yeah, the hackathon thing ended already. Uh, yeah, they do. They do some really interesting things with uh, agent. Like they they do like these races and and they have these uh, uh more like I don't want to say like remember the code battles where you used to have C you have two C programs fight it out. They do something similar, but they're looking for to like there's a leaderboard on agent performance that they are sponsoring. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, how many stars on auto gen here? 16,000, okay. Yeah. Yeah. In order of magnitude so, less. <laughs> but I'm trying to get some folks it's on Microsoft. here next year. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe this is what Sam's working on. Yeah, be Auto GPT is an agent framework, but it's uh it's an interesting project where you can initially it was set up so you could give it goals, and say here's five goals that I want you to complete, and it would go out and spin off the agents to go complete those goals. Like I want I want to increase my social media presence on LinkedIn, and it would figure out all the things like what are you interested in, what do you want to talk about, like. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's it's the shape of things to come. It's of course it's it's all early, but it's a lot more than what auto that ChatGPT can do, which is answer a question. Right, right. Cool. Hey Pat, man, great to see you. I'm going to be at Nurips, I think, the week of of that AI Dev conference. So, I, there are a lot of people there, but that's the nerdy. If you're a practitioner. <laughs> You're going to San Jose. If you're a nerd like you, you're going to to New Orleans. So I get it. I know. I yeah. I have some some customer meetings and things. So yeah, get part of it. Uh... Here, okay. I, I just posted a video so everyone could check it out. Um, I this is me talking smack. So you'll you'll see it. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh geez. Yeah. <laughs> you'll appreciate that. Have All a great right. uh, holiday week if you're in the U.S. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah, yeah have you. a great week, buddy. All right. Thanks bye -bye. for joining. Yeah, see you soon. Yeah, bye, everyone.